Uh, we're going to be uh, talking about glutathione and its uh, special role in heart disease. Um, so uh, we're going to be going beyond heart disease. Let's call it cardiovascular disease. Uh, that will be uh, a little bit more uh, all-inclusive. And uh, glutathione, of course, um, many of you have been in tune with this uh, this webinar series, but and have uh, access to much more information about glutathione. But there is always new people's on the call, so we'll just very quickly speak about glutathione. Uh, glutathione, it's a substance um, that appears in every single cell uh, of your body, and in fact, it is essential uh, to life. Uh, there um, have been over 175,000 medical and scientific publications on it. Uh, just to put that into context, um, if you go to PubMed, which is the major repository of uh, scientific articles written in the world, uh, you might find 40 or 50,000 on vitamin C and maybe 60,000 on vitamin E, but there's over 175,000 on glutathione, which is more than vitamin C and vitamin E put together. So it certainly has drawn a huge amount of attention from the scientific world. And this is now uh, increasingly making it into uh, the lay literature, into uh, uh, the internet, into websites, and uh, glutathione will soon become a part of your everyday regular English language, the same way as a word like antioxidant or cholesterol, which used to be strange, uh, now is used on a regular basis. So when we look at PubMed, again, the PubMed is a place that every researcher is on every day. If you want to look up the, the original articles written on any scientific or medical topic, you go to PubMed. Uh, when you punch in the search term um, of glutathione and cardiology, uh, you'll see the number that you get there, cardiac, heart disease, uh, hypertension. Uh, really, uh, this, this is a search uh, that I did in just about a year ago. So um, by 2023, there's easily over 20,000 articles just written on glutathione and cardiovascular disease. So uh, this gives us a lot of material to go through and a lot of material to hang our hat on uh, when we're speaking about it. Uh, getting back to glutathione, uh, let me say that this is probably the most important slide that you're going to see tonight. You can't eat glutathione and expect it to raise your body's glutathione. It just doesn't work that way. When you eat glutathione, it becomes rapidly broken down in the digestive tract and very little of it makes it into your cells. A glutathione is made within your cells. You, you can't take glutathione in from the outside. You need to make it yourself in your cells. And to do that, you need to give your cells the building blocks, the specific nutrients that the cell requires to make glutathione itself, something that we call precursors. So if you remember any slide tonight, um, remember this one. And where do we get these precursors? Well, if you look up at one of these two books, you see those, those two blue books there. Uh, one is the CPS, a Compendium of Pharmaceutical Specialties uh, from Canada. And the other book is called the PDR, the Physician's Desk Reference. This is a, a similar book in the United States. And one of these books will sit on the desk of every single doctor and every single pharmacist in North America. 
And this is where a doctor or a pharmacist will find drugs that a doctor can write a prescription for. Now, in the section that starts with I, um, you will find uh, something called Immunical, which is not a drug, it's a natural product. And it's written up the same way as a drug would be with uh, indications, contraindications, clinical pharmacology. And Immunical is actually a very specially prepared whey protein isolate. Um, the other precursor that you'll find in these uh, one of these books is NAC, N-acetylcysteine, uh, which is a drug um, that we use uh, uh, in the hospital. You can find it at a natural health food store. It's an excellent glutathione precursor, but it does have some problems. Um, it has a short half-life, so you need to take it several times during the day, and it does give you side effects. So these are the only two glutathione precursors that you will find in these two books. Uh, what about intravenous glutathione? Well, um, intravenous glutathione does in fact uh, work, um, but it also has a problem of, of hanging around really uh, for a very short uh, period of time. Um, it, it lasts literally only for minutes. Um, this is a paper that shows that the half-life of intravenous glutathione is around 20 minutes. Other papers show that it's much less than that. Uh, on YouTube, you can see some rather fantastic videos. For example, uh, Parkinson's patients that receive intravenous glutathione. They're, they're brought in on a wheelchair, all hunched over, and uh, after receiving uh, IV glutathione, they get out of the wheelchair and start walking around nearly normally, uh, which is fantastic. Now, the problem is, uh, by the time they get back home, um, they're back in the wheelchair, uh, not any different than they were before. So it doesn't last very long. Uh, there are other uh, uh, mechanisms that are sold uh, on the internet or in health food store that claim to raise glutathione. There are glutathione patches, there's uh, topical glutathione, there's liposomal glutathione, um, and on and on and on. Uh, and none of these have really been well-defined as a legitimate way of raising uh, glutathione. Um, there are some articles that look at inhaled glutathione. Uh, those will work on the tissues that they touch. In other words, in your throat, uh, in your in your uh, uh, bronchi, uh, in, in, in the surface of your lungs, but it doesn't travel to the rest of uh, your body. So uh, just very briefly on the roles of glutathione, uh, we uh, talk about an idea, a glutathione. What a great idea. Uh, what does idea stand for? Well, the I stands for the immune system. The D stands for detoxification. E stands for energy. And A stands for antioxidant. If you could remember these four letters, then you understand probably 90% of what glutathione does in your body. Let's look at these in turn. Uh, I for the immune system. Uh, the people with low glutathione levels um, have immunocompromise by definition. Uh, people with high glutathione levels uh, can optimize their immune response. So think of glutathione literally as food for the immune system. Uh, D for detoxification. Well, this is how we detoxify things like cigarette smoke and automobile exhaust and pesticides and, and, and herbicides and, and heavy metal. Uh, I tell people that next to water, next to water, uh, glutathione is our most important detoxification substance. Now, E, we could look at energy. Uh, we could or we probably will uh, do a, a complete webinar just on how glutathione maintains uh, energy, uh, uh, both in a full body level and on a molecular level. And finally, A, uh, glutathione 
uh, is uh, referred to as the master antioxidant. And the reason it's called the master antioxidant is that none of the known antioxidants, and we know between 2,000 and 4,000 uh, different antioxidants, none of the antioxidants, including vitamin C and vitamin E, can work without the presence of glutathione. So you remember these four things, um, then you're way ahead in the game of understanding glutathione. So tonight's topic is glutathione and heart disease, or glutathione and the cardiovascular system. Cardio means heart, and vascular means the circulatory system. So if we do a closer look at a blood vessel, uh, here we have an artery. And on the outside of the artery, we have a layer called an epithelium, which is a, a tough, uh, uh, fibrous uh, coating. It's a kind of like protection uh, for the artery, so it doesn't get damaged from the outside. Uh, you've got a middle layer called a mesothelium, and this is a muscular layer. Uh, it can relax and open up uh, the tube, or it can contract and close the tube down. And this is important in uh, controlling blood flow and oxygen and blood pressure and many other things. Um, on the very inside is something called an endothelium. Uh, this is uh, a word that we're going to be uh, uh, using a bit in uh, tonight's lecture. It's a very, very thin, very fragile uh, inner layer. And then uh, that green stuff there, um, that's just a buildup of gunk uh, that uh, happens inside of our arteries that leads to cardiovascular disease or arteriosclerosis. So, um, just think of the vascular system, the cardiovascular system, uh, like uh, like plumbing, and um, the inflammation and the buildup of junk inside of these uh, the, uh, tubes uh, is what leads to disease, kind of like rust in the pipes. And here we see a heart and we see uh, some vessels, some blood vessels uh, that feed the heart. These are arteries that provide the heart itself uh, with nutrients and oxygen. And we see uh, in this section over here, a cross section, we've opened up this vessel and we see a buildup of this gunk inside of the vessel um, that's developed a clot inside. And this part of the heart will suffer a heart attack. It will be deprived of nutrients and oxygen, and a section of the heart uh, will die, or the patient might die. So this is essentially uh, the problem. Now, getting back to that endothelium, here's a cross-section of, of an artery, and that endothelium is just a one-cell thick, very, very thin lining that is very fragile, and very prone uh, to injury, okay? So that endothelium, we're gonna be talking about the endothelium. Uh, let's see how this endothelium uh, can be uh, affected or damaged. So here we have our three layers. Again, the endothelium is the um, inner layer and the blood goes through this too. Um, we have fats in our blood. We, we need these fats, what are called lipids, of uh, things like cholesterol and triglycerides. We, uh, we require them for energy. We require them for uh, building uh, um, other tissues. But when you get too much of it, or it's the wrong type, they can accumulate inside of this tube. They will stick onto... Um, the uh, uh, endothelium. Um, what does glutathione do? Well, glutathione can actually have an effect of lowering these lipids, lowering cholesterol uh, to a certain degree. So glutathione is protective there. Um, the next step is that 
these fatty streaks uh, get oxidized. Um, remember, we're talking about glutathione as an antioxidant, and uh, they attract uh, inflammatory cytokines. These are little molecules uh, sent out by the immune system to try to uh, clear up damage, but sometimes they cause damage themselves. So you end up with a damaged endothelium. Um, glutathione is important here because it uh, suppresses the oxidation and it also uh, will minimize the inflammation caused by these cytokines. Uh, after a while, uh, this injury becomes more pronounced and it starts to clot. Uh, and there are other chemicals that uh, attract uh, platelets and these platelets get stuck on there. And after a while, uh, you end up with a blood clot inside of the artery to make things worse. Uh, glutathione actually stabilizes platelets and will reduce that reaction somewhat. Um, and after that gunk has been there for a while, it starts to collect things like um, calcium and uh, the calcium gets stuck on it and there's further scarring and further inflammation and uh, a potentially disastrous uh, result. So the, the key here is that these circulating fats like cholesterol, when they become oxidized, they change in their nature and they become stickier. And so they gum up the inside of these tubes and they get stuck to the endothelial lining. There's that word again. Um, damage them and cause plaque formation. Now, the major substance, here's the key, the major substance that stops the fats from being oxidized, it stops them from being stickier, is a substance we call glutathione peroxide. If you have high glutathione levels, you have high glutathione peroxide levels, and you can slow this process down. And in an ideal world, if uh, the person is exercising, uh, not smoking, uh, eating right, um, you can possibly even um, reverse uh, the formation of uh, atherosclerosis. So how common is this plaque formation, this sclerosis formation, this gumming up of our arteries. Here's a very scary study. It, it looks at young people and look what it shows, okay? Uh, this, these are age groups. About a third of teenagers show evidence of plaque formation in their arteries, a third of teenagers. And by the time North Americans reach the age of 25, over half of them, demonstrate this process. So if we were to, to do angiograms on, on uh, 25 year olds, over half of them are gonna show some narrowing of their arteries. And in the Western world, these dangerous changes can be almost considered as normal, almost a normal part of the aging process. Uh, but uh, in other parts of the world with a, a different diet and a different lifestyle, um, this may not exist at all. So this is preventable. This is entirely uh, preventable. Uh, here uh, we see the effect of glutathione levels have in protecting these fragile endothelial cells. Uh, when glutathione levels are elevated, there's less damage. When glutathione levels are decreased, the damage is greater. I mean, this is very, very straightforward. Uh, here's a study done on metabolic syndrome. Uh, metabolic syndrome, I mean, many of you know what that is. For those of you who haven't heard of this, uh, it's actually a, a, a very uh, common um, disorder. And you know, many of the listeners out there today are suffering from this. In certain populations, it could be as high as a third of the population. Uh, what it represents is a combination of high blood pressure, 
high blood sugar, high cholesterol, and increased belly fat. And I'm sure you all know people that have this combination. And when these people are compared to a normal population, both their glutathione levels are significantly lower and their endothelial damage is higher. In other words, the damage uh, to their arteries has already started and uh, they are at risk for um, a cardiovascular event, an event being a heart attack or a stroke or some other disaster. In this study, uh, researchers looked at hypertensive or high blood pressure patients. Hypertension is high blood pressure. And they describe how glutathione plays a role in nitric oxide metabolism. Nitric oxide is a, a molecule uh, involved in vasodilation or how wide the blood vessels can become to allow nutrients and oxygen uh, through to the organs. And they conclude that the normal decrease on glutathione levels that happen as we age, you see, the older we get, the lower our glutathione levels become, might explain the increase in high blood pressure as we age. It's fantastic. So hypertension, high blood pressure becomes more common as we get older. And they're saying that that's at least in part because we lose glutathione as we age. Uh, in this paper uh, published in the journal called Hypertension, um, they measured blood pressure and looked for an association with both homocysteine levels and glutathione levels. Uh, high homocysteine, um, as you know, is a known risk factor for the development of cardiovascular disease. And patients with high blood pressure, as predicted, had higher homocysteine levels and lower glutathione levels than the normal population. Let's look at diabetes. Now, why are we talking about diabetes? We're talking cardiovascular disease. Well, the major complications from having diabetes is number one, uh, you're, immunocom you're, you're immunocompromised, so you're more prone to getting infections. Uh, diabetics have toe infections and lung infections and bladder infections uh, much more um, than their uh, healthy counterpart. But the major cause of mortality and morbidity in diabetes is because of vascular or cardiovascular uh, disease. If the small vessels are affected in diabetes, you get diabetic blindness, you get neuropathies, you get uh, kidney failure. If the larger vessels are affected, you get heart attacks and stroke, and diabetics are much, much more at risk, much more prone to develop um, heart attacks and stroke. So let's look at cardiovascular disease in, um, in diabetics. Uh, this chart shows the relationship between sugar levels, glutathione levels, and endothelial damage. Again, pretty straightforward. Higher glutathione levels, less blood vessel damage. Higher sugar levels, more blood vessel damage. So we can look at glutathione diabetes not as a treatment for sugar levels. It's not going to make a big difference in your sugar level. But what it will do, it will cut down on the major complication of diabetes, which is cardiovascular disease. So this is true preventive medicine. Uh, this article showed up in the journal Free Radical Research. Uh, they were looking at younger people with coronary artery disease, uh, what we call premature coronary artery disease that happens below the age of 45. Uh, these patients had higher levels of oxidative stress and lower levels of glutathione. Uh, in fact, the team suggests that these tests be used as a screening tool for picking up these cases early on so that preventive measures can be undertaken. 
Uh, this suggestion was confirmed by this article uh, that appears in the journal Stroke. A stroke, although not a heart disease, is high on the list of cardiovascular disease. And they clearly state that low glutathione levels represent a risk factor for stroke and cardiovascular disease. So just uh, to summarize, uh, glutathione lowers lipid peroxidation. In other words, it lowers the oxidation of fats like cholesterol. Uh, to a small degree, it can decrease circulating cholesterol. Uh, it can raise uh, HDL, which is high density lipoproteins, which is the good cholesterol, HDL happy H, LDL lousy L, it can prevent endothelial damage. It stabilizes platelets. It can lower hypertension, and it can minimize inflammatory responses around the plaque. So glutathione levels may be predictive in cardiovascular disease. In other words, it could be used as a screening test, but in addition to be potentially therapeutic. In other words, a treatment for cardiovascular or heart disease. So thank you very much for, for your attention.